morning, the jury handed <coughs> Chief Suda a note. The court will take the note from Chief Suda. <coughs> the note will be marked Court Exhibit 6, Madam Clerk. The note is dated the 1st of March, 2024, 10.50 a.m. By the jury four person, Your Honor, the jury has reached a unanimous verdict for all six counts. Mark is court exhibit six, signed by the four person. You can bring the jury in. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the clerk will ask you a series of questions. Uh, please uh, pay close attention to Madam Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as your names are called, can you please rise, remain standing, and indicate your presence by saying either here or present. And you can mute, Madam Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in the case of the kit of the state of Connecticut versus Michelle Traconis, have you agreed upon a verdict? Yes. yes. Will the four person please rise and identify himself? Everyone else can sit, have a seat. Will the defendant, Michelle Traconis, please rise and face the jury? In file number FST, CR 20024-1178T, State of Connecticut versus Michelle Traconis. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty of the first count of the information charging the defendant with conspiracy to commit murder in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A, 48A, and 53A-54A, Subsection A? Guilty. Guilt what say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty on the second count of the information to the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A-155, Subsection A, Subsection 1? Guilty. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty on the third count of the information to the charge of tampering with physical evidence in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A-8, Subsection A? Guilty. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty on the fourth count of the information to the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A-48, Subsection A, and 53A-155, Subsection A, Subsection 1. Guilty. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty on the fifth count of the information to the charge of tampering with physical evidence in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A-8, Subsection A? Guilty. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is she guilty or not guilty on the fifth count of the information to the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree in violation of Connecticut General Statutes, Section 53A-165, Subsection A, Subsection 3, and 53A-166? Guilty. You ladies and I'm sorry, one moment. Uh, 
The court will then accept the verdict. The Your verdicts Honor, are accepted and recorded. Your Honor, I'd ask that the jury be polled, please. Do you have the polling document, Madam Clerk? I will call upon you one at a time and ask you to rise and remain standing when called. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information of the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering <clears throat> prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. 
Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of tampering with physical evidence? Yes. Is it your verdict that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, is guilty to the information on the charge of hindering prosecution in the second degree? Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may return to the deliberation room. If I may be heard, Your Honor. Yes. Your Honor, at this point, the state is moving uh, the court to revoke the defendant's bond or in the alternative, at a minimum, double it and make significant conditions upon her release if she were able to make it. Uh, she no longer entertains the privileges of the presumption of innocence as she has been found guilty by a jury of her peers of all six counts. Uh, one of those counts being a conspiracy to commit murder. The, there's also the a, another warrant being prepared currently for her with respect to the charges of contempt of court. And the if she is going to be making any kind of bond, the state would ask for strict conditions of house arrest and electronic monitoring, GPS bracelet. However, considering the fact that she has absolutely no ties to the state of Connecticut, has significant ties out of the country, let alone out of the state, uh, the state feels that this would be appropriate to revoke her bond in its entirety. So the state would ask for that. Well, um, as far as I know, Connecticut does not have a no bond rule until the question is until uh, sentencing and appeal. So that would not be even within the purview of the court. But I'll just note for almost five years, um, Mr. Ponis has been out on a two point for at least over four years at this point, $2.1 million bond. Uh, she's appeared at every court uh, appearance that was required. Uh, she has been allowed to travel. The state has continued to hold her passport. Um, I am in possession of her uh, Venezuelan passport and I've had it since um, I've been in the case. And in any event, the United States does not have diplomatic relations with Venezuela, so she wouldn't even be able to obtain another one from that country. So I ask the court to maintain the current bond. She has a, a teenage daughter uh, that she is, the, and at least for the time being, remains the primary caregiver for her. She's appeared at all times. Her family all live in the United States. She's an American citizen. And I ask that the court not increase her bond and let her remain at liberty until sentencing. Thank you. Well, the bond set only on docket number ending in 1178. I would refer to the clerk, Your Honor. Uh, I could answer bonds. that question. The first docket no, number. going to refer to the clerk. Oh. We did a motion for joinder. The other two cases are closed out. So everything's on 1178. Thank you. And, and does the court wish to know how much there was on the other uh, cases as well or no? Well, it's only one docket number. Right. The court is going to set the bond on one docket number. Yes. Six million dollars cash assurity. Oh, Your Honor, I would ask if the court is going, since the court is setting a bond, that if she does happen to make it, we are looking for conditions. The court will impose the following additional conditions house arrest, electronic monitoring. GPS monitoring, and the passport has already been surrendered. I believe we need a date for sentencing, Your Honor, and a PSI. Madam Clerk, sentencing date. Hold on one second. So we can do May 24th. Perhaps that would be an inappropriate day, Your Honor. Yes, if we could, please do the week after. May 31st. Thank you. 
May 31st sentencing. We stand adjourned. All rise. The Honorable Superior Court now stands adjourned. Everyone, please. Wow, that was uh, dramatic. I hope everyone is uh, hearing me okay. Give me the thumbs up if uh, if you can hear me, um, which I think you can. Um, they started uh, deliberating uh, earlier in the week. I believe Monday it went, um, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. I can't even remember now. Closing arguments. They deliberated for a very short time. And, um, and, then they did a full day of deliberations. I believe it was Wednesday now that I'm thinking about it and deliberated all day yesterday. Uh, the one question they had for the judge was uh, rehearing some testimony of Michelle Traconis's best friend. And that was interesting because it didn't seem like there was much to what the friend had to say. We still don't know why the jury requested that. Maybe jurors will speak out. Um, but after uh, after that, they uh, were actually brought into there. She is Clara Patu Duperon. She was a witness uh, brought by the defense. Jurors sent a note to the judge asking to rewatch the 38 minute court testimony. Jurors took notes while rewatching the entire testimony. But obviously, the main headline here is guilty on all counts and we've been doing shows on this uh, all week long most experts did not think she would be guilty on a conspiracy to commit murder charge but obviously uh not the case uh the jury saw it the state's way and uh convicted her guilty on all counts including the conspiracy to commit murder charge um what's interesting about this um, and I, we don't have a lawyer with us right now, um, but here are the charges, I believe. Conspiracy to commit murder, guilty. Tampering with physical evidence, two counts, guilty. Conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence, two counts, guilty. Um, so she's going to be going away for a, a very long time. These are serious charges. What's interesting um, Judge Kevin Randolph, who's had such a great command and continued to, he uh, announced sentencing for May 31st. But Michelle Traconis is able to go home on, I believe, a six million dollar bond until sentencing, which is three months away. That is a long time. Uh, can she get the six million is the question. Um, I do wish we had a, a lawyer in the house here, but. I don't think that um, she has to come up with the full amount, if I am correct, that is a percentage of that amount, um, whether she can even come up with a percentage of that. Uh, let's say it's uh, uh, 10%. It's still 600000 if I'm doing my math right. Um, so it is a still, it still is a, a large sum of money. Um, there's a separate issue, this contempt warrant, which now sort of takes a back seat. Uh, that's going to be heard in court on March 5th, I believe. That had to do with some uh, evidence brought in uh, accidentally that was supposed to be court sealed. Um, but as Debbie Gibby here says, uh, at least 25 to 30 years. And uh, she has a child. Obviously, Jennifer Farber Dulos had children. It is always the children who suffer. But this is going to be a very, 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 very difficult thing for Michelle Traconis to wrap her head around. Imagine uh, you are just sentenced to 20 to 30 years, not sentenced, convicted, and the sentencing is three months away, but you know that you're facing 20 to 30 years behind bars. Um, that is a very daunting, um, you know, da daunting uh, hill or mountain to overcome. But um, the, the jury says, look, she is guilty of conspiring to murder Jennifer Farber Dulos and murderers have consequences. And this is the way the jurors saw it. Again, most of the experts that we had on 
never ever thought um the, the the vast majority that she would be convicted on all counts and that's why they also thought that deliberations were going the length that they had gone uh this trial began uh january 11th look at this the coe's here uh coe were you uh were you surprised by uh the guilty on all counts there this is the first time we've done something together, COE. This is a historic <laughs> day, not just for Michelle Traconis, but for you and I, a day I'll never forget. Uh, were you surprised by that? Um, I, I, I was somewhat surprised. I mean, I watched the in, entire trial. We watched every single day on our STS trial channel, all 27 days of the trial. It was a lot of information. I was somewhat torn on the conspiracy. I probably would have voted guilty on all, but I know that the last couple of days of the trial, I was still torn on whether or not I thought there was enough evidence to prove conspiracy, but I thought all of the other charges for sure were guilty. And I think for the most part, that was the, the discussion that we had here at STS in the chats. Was there enough for conspiracy? As of yesterday afternoon, we had 1300 people who took a poll and at STS Nation, I believe 52% of people did think that Michelle Draconis was going to come back guilty on all three charges, a total of six counts. And that's what happened today. So STS was spot on. The majority did vote in favor of what the jurors believed. And there was a lot of evidence, Joel, as you know, we've been talking about it. Um, there were nine hours of video. There were 27 very, very long days of trial, not just for the jurors, but even for us watching at home, it, it was a lot to absorb and a lot to take in. And in terms of the exhibits, there were 230 or maybe a little bit more, even 230 pieces of evidence that were entered as exhibits for the jurors to understand, to absorb, and then to reflect on. So it was a lot of information. And this was one of the longest trials that Connecticut has ever seen. And uh, that is all uh, all good points. Um, Anne Marie pointing out that she is from uh, a wealthy family, as was Jennifer Farber Dulos. But uh, money doesn't buy everything, and it's certainly not going to buy freedom. Uh, what I'm immediately thinking about this is the same situation that happened with Fotis Dulos. He was uh, a, he was awaiting trial. He wasn't convicted, but he was uh, able to bond out. Went home and uh, connected a hose to his tailpipe, and that was the end of Fotis Dulos. And I'm wondering, um, you know, I hope that is not the end result. You never want to see someone unalive themselves, but um, this is, uh, like I said, going to be a really bitter pill for Michelle Traconis to swallow. Kathy P. in Arizona saying, I believe Michelle Traconis is 47, which I am almost certain that is correct. By the way, Maui, Swift, and OG, thank you so much for this. Um, but... Michelle Traconis at 47, she faces up to 30 years. You do the math, that's 77. And um, that is a, uh, uh, you know, you guys know my feelings on prison. So if I knew I was basically facing the rest of my life, not to mention that uh, lifespans in prison are substantially less. So, um, you know, she's basically looking at the rest of her life. Um, I think I was correct at 600,000. I saw someone else say it's a much lower number, but it is about six hundred thousand dollars that she needs for a very wealthy family. Um, it might uh, people are yelling at me. It's not right. But uh, six hundred thousand for her is no biggie. So we will see uh, what was interesting, too, about this case. Um, like the CEO, the notorious CEO, we said it was seven weeks of evidence. The trial began on January 11th. There were six jurors here it started off with five alternates and three of them got knocked out so uh, we ended up the trial with six jurors and two alternates remained and uh coe how do you think that impacted it um the fact that there were six people uh did take basically a full week to do, not a full week but you know what i'm saying a large it, majority it, it, of the week so Tuesday afternoon, they had about an hour of deliberating. Then they deliberated all Wednesday. And by all Wednesday, I mean, they had a full one hour lunch break. And I think they had one other short break in there. They started at 10 and then they ended around 440. So it, it wasn't as long as some other courts have their delivery. I mean, some courts allow people to deliberate all night if they want to. So it was two and a half days. 
But I think the jurors did a really good job. I know that obviously on that first full day on Wednesday, they did ask the judge to replay the entire 38 minute video of the testimony of Michelle Traconis's friend, Petu. And then the following day, they had two questions and they wanted clarification on tampering and on whether or not there needed to be some kind of physical touch, some kind of contact for them to be able to find someone guilty of tampering. So I do think they did a really good job. I think having six jurors probably helped them because they didn't have as many people to have to find a unanimous vote. So I think depending on, on the case, six jurors versus 12 could be helpful or hurtful. But I think here it seemed like they really worked well together and they were really good about going through the charges and the counts one by one and really looking at the verbiage and making sure that they understood by law what they needed to do. Yeah. I mean, with six jurors, um, it is obviously a lot easier to get to a final decision, a consensus, and it is with 12 jurors, uh, not to mention there was no opening statements in this trial. There are never really opening statements in the state of Connecticut, we found out, but most of us are not used to that. KCL, who's on top of everything, Joel on this bond, since they were asking for cash, I believe it is the full amount, if I'm not mistaken. But then there's this comment, 10% fee plus collateral for $6 million. I'm not sure how they decide on the collateral. Uh, then Marianne Nizio is telling me it's 19%. So a lot of different takes. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, Marianne Nizio corrected herself to 10%. Um, but different jurisdictions have different rules. I mean, the bottom line there, though, um, the bottom line is that she's going to be facing up to 30 years in prison um, on these charges. And again, that would put her at 77, uh, 77 years old. So um, and Oli, Oli, Oli Inca is saying still 10 percent of six million is six hundred thousand uh, COE. So this woman, Carla Petou Duperon, do you have any thoughts on why out of everything and the two other things that you just mentioned, um, why they wanted to rehear what she had to say? Do you have any thoughts on why that, uh, why they brought back her testimony? So she was brought in to help the defense. She was a defense witness and she was the last witness that the defense brought in. She was Michelle Draconis's friend and she was there to help the defense in theory. But if you watch the interview, there are many things that were brought up that made almost points for the prosecution because while she was able to say that Michelle Traconis appeared to be completely normal when she interacted with her, there were also many questions that were brought up. And she did discuss you know, the fireplace or, or the chimney. She did discuss the fact that she, this person, Patu, Michelle Draconis's friend, never wanted to, never followed up and never went back to speak with investigators. So there were many holes that she put in the case when she was interviewed. So while she was brought on to help the defense, I think in the end, she she ended up raising more questions and more doubt in, in what was being presented to us by the defense. And I think quite honestly, that was the issue with a lot of the defense witnesses. These ex were, experts were brought in and I think the state did a really good job in their cross of the defense's witness in making their, th there was just a lot of room for questioning whatever they were saying. And then they were almost creating more confusion. So I do think all of that did help the prosecution even though the defense witnesses were obviously supposed to be there to help Michelle Traconis and to help the defense's case. Yeah. Um, I'm just reaching out to a couple of attorneys to get their take. So Annie K says she's going to be out and gone to Venezuela where she's a citizen. The problem is they've seized her passport. She's got an ankle monitor. We remember in the Adelson case, Donna Adelson, who didn't have any of those things, tried to make a run for it to Vietnam uh, via Dubai, and she was uh, stopped. Her her passport was flagged. She was stopped on the uh, on the jetway. So um, unless she gets um, somehow uh, onto a boat um, in her backyard, it's going to be hard for her to escape 
Um, but I, I can't imagine. Um, just think about that for a minute. Um, you are now, you know, you're going to go to a prison for 20 to 30 years. You have a child at home and now you have to sit there for three months until you find that out to be fact. Um, I cannot imag imagine the anxiety uh, associated with that, but it's got to be awful. The real victims here, obviously, besides Jennifer Farber Dulos, um, is the children. She had five children, um, some of them younger than Michelle's children. Here's a photo of Jennifer Farber Dulos. And uh, those kids were uh, old enough now to be in the courtroom for closing arguments with Michelle Farber Dulos's. Um, mother Gloria Farber he means and, Jennifer uh, Farber Dulos. What did I say? Michelle Farber Dulos. It's okay. Oh, I meant it's Jennifer. My apologies. Jennifer. It was a long night. Um, so, um, they are the real victims here. They're now living with Gloria Farber, uh, the grandmother in New York City. Um, thankfully, one thing uh, that they have on their side is. You know, financially, they don't have a lot of concerns. The kids can still go to school, do all those things, despite having lost both parents. But, um, of course, uh, the real tragedy is you're looking at it right there. Jennifer Farber on the right and her five children. Look how cute they are. Um, all dressed up in a little preppy and, outfits. Um, and those kids. Are are, uh, sorry to go take over you, but I just want to say those kids. This is an old you photo. It, you do it in real life, Bugs. Go ahead, CoE. Oh, yeah. So why why be anything but myself? Uh, so these kids here. This is an old photo. They were obviously very young and adorable in that photo, but they're now much older. I think they're everywhere between twelve or thirteen. I think one of them just turned thirteen, and I think the eldest are seventeen or eighteen. So they're in middle school. They're in high school. They're old enough to understand everything that's going on. As Joel already mentioned, they were there for closing arguments. Some of them were there for some other days as well with their grandmother. And so they're watching, they're absorbing. And now, obviously, there is some justice for Jennifer. We discussed this throughout the trial. Obviously, there is some justice for the mother, Gloria, who had to experience the loss of her daughter. There is some justice for these five children who don't have a mother and no longer have a father either. But there is still so much that they have to mourn because they don't have answers there today. Obviously they did see a, a guilty verdict, but they still don't know where the body of Jennifer Farber Dulos is. And so in a case like this, I find it so tragic because there is no justice. Jennifer is not coming back. We still don't have so many answers that I'm sure that family would want to know and would need to know for some kind of closure. But obviously when you lose a loved one, there is no closure. Their life is forever changed. These children don't have a mother. They don't have a father. They're being raised by their 80-something-year-old grandmother and their nanny. And that's it. I mean, their yeah. their life is what it is. And that's a very, very tragic circumstance to be in. And it's uh there's a difference between 80 and 88. The mother, the grandmother is 88, and that is a tough uh you know, that's a, that's not an easy age to take care, care of five young kids. If I'm not mistaken, COE, uh, the nanny who testified in this trial is still their nanny. Is that right? Do you know? She is. Luckily, she has decided to stick by them and continue to to be with the kids and, and move to New York and be there with them. But, I, you know, and, and as wonderful as that is, and there's consistency and there's love and there's comfort, and she obviously was dealing with everything with them. These kids still don't have a mom. They don't have a dad. And now they've been exposed to so many details. I mean, I know so many of us here at STS who were watching the 27 days of trial, we were listening to the details and we were horrified by some of the images, the images of the blood and the shirt soaked in blood. And so for these kids to be able to know what happened or what didn't happen and to still be wondering about where their mother really is, I mean, that's horrifying. I wouldn't want my kids to even have to think about something close to that, let alone have to experience that. 100%. Um, Stardusted, this comment is interesting to me. For a few weeks, basically three months, being at home, who would pay that much? Now, when you're uh, taking a walk today or in the shower or hanging out by yourself, that is um, how much people value freedom. If you think about it, to pay $600,000 to get three months of freedom. Uh, freedom is everything. 
Uh, more than that, obviously, is health. But I think right behind health um, is freedom. And when it's taken away, um, Sh Michelle Traconis, I can guarantee you, would do anything and everything right now to uh, be able to pay her way out of this altogether. Uh, but that's not happening because that does not happen in the United States of America. Justice for all 65. Uh, I can empathize with this comment because I'm the same way. Joel, it's very hard for me to not feel sorry for Michelle Traconis. But then again, I think about Jennifer being the mother of five and having her life taken away senselessly. So much tragedy. Uh, Kat's addict uh, right after that. With a little less empathy, Michelle is guilty and is where she belongs. Justice for Jennifer. So uh, 100%. I mean, justice for Jennifer all the way and for the kids. But, um, you know, you can't be happy, I don't think. I don't think that's the right word. You might be um, really relieved that's a better word relieved or satisfied that the guilty party in this case uh has been convicted by a jury of her peers but certainly not a happy day for anyone and certainly not for this family um these kids uh, i think do know some of them uh what is happening now i think they're old enough now to realize what is happening and, and i can't imagine uh the heartbreak i mean remember they didn't just lose uh, their mother in the murder, but they lost their father to him unaliving uh, himself. Um, just very quickly, uh, the state, they uh, delivered their um, closing arguments uh, very early in the week. It was uh, Prosecutor Michelle Manning and Sean McGinnis, and some people uh, were being critical of both of them that they weren't strong enough with their case, uh, but obviously they got their job done. And the uh, nutshell, uh, the headline of that uh, closing argument that was that Michelle Traconis was angry and she was fed up with the divorce case and had called Jennifer Dulos a lot of disparaging names. Um, and then they went to Fotis Dulos's phone. He left his phone at his house in Farmington um, and she was answering it. And that was in an attempt to create this alibi. So uh, COE. Um, how big a factor do you think that is that she was helping him with this alibi in terms of pointing to her guilt along the way? Well, I think that was what this case came down to. And I know in our STS chat, so many of us were discussing this. The whole issue with conspiracy was, did she know? And even, our, even the attorneys, and I know some of you guys had a hard time listening to the defense attorneys that we had on STS. I read every single comment that you guys uh, put in the chats and also on all the YouTube pages. Um, but some of you guys were saying that you did believe that that she would be found guilty on the conspiracy charges. And clearly you were right. But the question was, in her mind, was there intent? Was she aware? Did she know what was going on? And clearly the jurors thought the answer was yes. And many of the evidence pieces didn't you know, there was no smoking gun here in this case, but many of the pieces of evidence did show that she very much was everywhere and involved in every step. Whether she was aware of it or not, that's what the conspiracy came down to. Did she just happen to be there? And that was the whole state's closing arguments. Was it coincidence? Was all of this coincidence? In fact, the prosecutor went on, I think for like, I don't know, three or four minutes, just listing everything. And he said, you know, was it coincidence that Michelle Traconis's number was written down at the car wash? Was it coincidence that Michelle Traconis was starting a fire on, you know, during Memorial Day weekend when the weather was really nice and most people don't, don't start a fire then? Was it coincidence? And he went over and over all of the evidence and clearly the jurors found that it was not coincidence, that it was evidence and that it was conspiracy to commit murder. And I mean, clearly today they they found their verdict and they chose guilty for all three charges, a total of six counts. Mm. Uh, COE, why don't you try to get, um, if you can, try to hustle an answer on this. I don't know. She's, she's quick with the Google. I'm actually looking... Um, um, yeah, Elf is asking if you can confirm six million cash assurity, no percentage. Uh, shout out to Elf, who's uh, always in the chat. Um, while the COE is looking for that, um, and you might find that on X, formerly Twitter. Um, 
rather be in Maui. Kent is up next. Better get your affairs in order. Uh, speaking, of course, about Kent, Kent Mawinney. A lot of people thought that this person, he is a uh, an attorney, was an attorney, and a friend of Fotis Dulos. And um, he is said to have helped with the alibi as well and uh, helped arrange some of this stuff. So uh, if I am him with the um, verdict today, I'm getting a lot more nervous. Now, there was talk that he would turn state's witness and would testify against Michelle Traconis, but I guess they didn't feel like they needed him, um, and maybe they played their cards right because now they've got Kent Mawinney waiting in the wings to prosecute him. And uh, again, if I'm him, extremely nervous uh, seeing this verdict, and he's an attorney, um, so uh, there you go. Does her family have enough money to make her disappear? Um, I think making... I assume you mean getting her out of the country somehow, not unaliving her. They wouldn't want to do that. But um, I think that uh, it is harder than you probably think uh, to get out of here. Um, she is bound with a GPS monitor around her ankle uh, that's being monitored constantly. Um, just think of it like your cell phone uh, map, like your Google Maps. And if you go out of a perimeter, alarms start to go off. And uh, law enforcement is notified and they can literally track her to the minute. So um, I was kind of half joking, uh, mostly joking. But in Connecticut, there's plenty of water that gets you out to the ocean. So if you got that kind of money um, and somehow she could make a run for it onto a boat, uh, Venezuela is not that far away, but um, it would cost a hell of a lot of money. And I don't know that you can physically uh and I don't know that you can physically do it. Um, KCL with a question here. I'm not sure. Um, and what Schoen, Schoenhorn said that she thought it was his girlfriend listed in his phone as a male. Then why didn't she answer the other calls too? Because she conspired to murder Jennifer. KCL always on top of everything. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, the, the, phone, the phone log was really interesting because, again, it did point. All, all of the signs were there. It was just a matter of fact of whether or not you thought there was intention or not. But all, I mean, all the signs were pointing to guilty. And I think I think no one doubted all of the other accounts. It just came down to conspiracy. But again, there were there were just there was so much evidence and all of the signs were pointing to guilty for a lot of people. Um, I know some people felt like she was not going to be found guilty for conspiracy. I think here at STS, 30% voted for that in our polls. Um, but the jurors, the jurors thought otherwise. I just want to mention, Joel, that I'm looking here at the local papers. I have not personally confirmed this. This is according to local papers. Um, they are saying that Traconis's bond was increased to $6 million, um, So family or friends would need to come up with $420,000 mm -hmm. non-refundable for her to be bonded out of prison. Yep. So it's, it sounds like a percentage there. Um, look at this, Kimber Miller, COE and Joel. Y'all are a fantastic team. I feel like a proud mama. Thank you. Uh, and this, by the way, oh, this, sorry, by the way, was not, this was not planned in any way. One thing you should know about the COE, her dad is an attorney and her sister is an attorney. Okay, so cool, she's, cool. Got it, she's got, she's got, she's got, she's got it. She's got it. She's got it in the blood. She's got it in the blood. Go ahead, COE. Um, hold on. I'm responding to Cohen. Uh, Joel, well, how much longer are you planning on staying on? He's trying to see if he can find an attorney. Uh, tell him that we've got it. You and I have this because I have to jump in about 15 minutes. Um, okay. um, with that, but are you, are you going to do coverage later on it? Um, I, I, uh, we can figure that out. I, I think it's Friday. I think we're doing coverage now. I'm doing Phil and Scott on Mercedes Vega at five. And um, maybe we can circle back to this next week, but I think we are okay. Uh, tell Steve Cohen to just hang on a sec. Uh, KS says, wait, there, there's a verdict? Yes, Michelle Traconis found guilty on all counts, all charges. Uh, she's going to be going away 20 to 30 years, and someone corrected us. She is 49 years old. I think she was maybe 47 at the time of her arrest, but 49 uh years old. And look at this. The state of Connecticut needs to put Kent on a no-fly list. He's probably on one because uh, if I was him, I'd be thinking of uh, getting out of Dodge, I got to tell you. Um, COE. Yeah. Michelle Trakis is 49. And uh, if you guys 
remember Jennifer Farber Doulis was 50 when she disappeared and was murdered. And so it, it's sort of ironic. It's like at the same point in their lives, their both their lives are are pretty much ending. I mean, Jennifer Farber Doulis's life was ended, not by her choice. And now Michelle Traconis's life will forever be changed. Her family will be forever affected. Um, that's just ironic that that, you know, they were almost the same age when their lives essentially both stopped. Yeah. And this is a woman, Michelle Traconis. She had her own media company. She had dual citizenship here and in uh, Venezuela. She'd spent some of her time here in Miami, but at one point was even an ESPN reporter in South America. I mean, she had a lot going for her. You know, we see this time and again. We're doing another show. By the way, uh, Charlie Adelson, for those of you who have been following uh, the whole Dan Markell Adelson um, murder case for years and years, Charlie Adelson was just moved to a new prison, uh, ranked the top 10 worst in Florida. So we put together a really very interesting show Monday night with a former warden, a former president of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the one and only Tommy Scoville, who are going to talk about uh, why they moved Charlie so quickly after he was brought to state prison. Oh. And then later in the week, we're going to do another story on the Adelsons regarding the digital forensics. But the reason I brought up the Adelsons, they had everything. Uh, the, Charlie Adelson was a successful periodontist, the father was a very successful dentist. Charlie drove around in a Ferrari and he, he sets up a murder for hire plot for his brother-in-law. And what's the end result? He's in a state prison. A this state prison, by the way, was deemed um, unfit for human beings at one point. That's how bad this state prison is. I mean, it's awful. And it, he gave all that up uh, to put a hit out on his brother-in-law to satisfy his mother. He doesn't even like his sister that much. It was the husband of the sister, Wendy Adelson. Uh, so you got to question people's motives, why they do these things. Why would Michelle Traconis do this? Um, it was clear that Fotis Dulos um, was a bit of a hothead, a, a crazy, if you will. And uh, she was succumbing to his wants and needs. And now she is going to spend basically the rest of her life behind bars. And it's really, it is heartbreaking when you think that Michelle Traconis' own child is going to have to visit her in a state prison in Connecticut. Um, Sarah Adams reminding us that sentencing is uh, May 30th. We will cover that for you live. COE, do you want to jump in with anything? Um, people um, do say yes, I talk too I, much. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm, I'm communicating with Space Coast to see if um, he can pull some stuff up. Um, space uh, Coast, yes, yeah. they're asking to replay the verdict. Uh, that would be, I know, great. I know I'm trying to see if we have some, if we can pull up a presser or, or anything, if we can't pull up a press conference right now, then we can definitely, um, air some press conference video for you guys, some sound and replay the verdict afterwards. But, um, space coast, if you can try to pull up, if you see anything, even on that news feed. Okay. Mm, yeah. Let's this, just, oh, this. this is, oh, this is going to be the, uh, Post verdict press conference. This is yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank uh, you so much, Space Coast. So they haven't started yet. Space Coast, you're the man. Uh, Space Coast on the West Coast behind the scenes. Um, just so everyone knows, so you don't think I'm rude, but in about 15 minutes, I have to jump because uh, Carm and I have studio space pre rented and we are recording our audio book. Um, but I'm going to leave you in good hands with the COE. Um, and you know what? The sentencing might be this. This is correct. I believe Fox News saying she's now facing up to 60 years. I think the 20 to 30 was on some of the lesser charges. But I do think that the conspiracy charge is a much stiffer charge. So um, we are literally talking. She's she never going to see the light of day though. again. Excuse me. Well, the attorney said she won't serve that, though. She'll only end up serving about half. Oh, uh, that. By the way, those sirens are in Connecticut, not in the COE's living room or my living room. Um, although you can hear Fred Brown's cat collar jingling when he runs around. Um, Britt Kay here, a uh, member for 13 months. Thank you so much, Britt. Kent Mawinney currently digging a second grave for himself. Yeah. Um, so COE, uh, I think perhaps the most damning and damaging evidence in this whole trial 
was obviously surveillance video of Michelle with Botus driving around Hartford, dumping off these bags. But also what was contained in these bags were was that bloody shirt and bra, Jennifer's DNA, zip tie uh, locks. Um, that does not look good. And of course, uh, Michelle Traconis's DNA was on there. Do you think that that is um, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back? Bloody bra and shirt. Honestly, no, I don't. I think in this case, um, okay, great. Sorry. I'm, I'm responding to Steve Cohen, who is in the private chat, Joel, if you want to look. Cool. Um, so I don't think it was just one thing because this case was very unusual. There was no smoking gun. You, re you really, really did have to watch 27 days of little bits and pieces to put it all together to really understand. And I think that's why the state did a really good job with their closing arguments of really honing in that it's not just one thing or two things or three things. There were so many things and it wasn't coincidence. How could all of these little things add up to just being coincidence? I also think, again, a lot of people were emphasizing on the fact that, uh, or emphasize the fact that Michelle Traconis at her house on a nice, you know, relatively warm day, especially for Connecticut, had a fire that was going and, and burning for no reason. Was that coincidence that on the same day that they were trying to get rid of all this evidence that Michelle Draconis had a fire burning when it was Memorial Day weekend and I believe it was like 70 degrees? So there were so many little moments like that where it made you think, is this reasonable? Does this make sense? in this circumstance, knowing everything that we know and having all of the other little bits and pieces of evidence that lined up, I think it was it was that. It wasn't just one moment or one piece of evidence. It was so many things. And people here in the chat, like Julie B. Me, they're saying, no, there's no such thing as coincidence. And I think that was a very, very strong moment in the closing argument. When the prosecutor, I wish I had it to, to pull up for us, but it's too complicated to, to get right now. But the prosecutor went on over and over again, asking if this is all coincidence. And I think that was the hard part when you're watching. I don't think it can all be coincidence. Um, tell Carm we love her. Uh, I saw this comment. I thought they were talking about me in the COE, but I think they're talking about Traconis and uh, <laughs> Fotis Dulos. Um, so happy to find the realize that and uh know that it's not about me and you coe um so again guilty on all counts the charges were um i'm shocked on the conspiracy verdict i didn't think they proved that you planned it and that is what most people are shocked on conspiracy to commit murder guilty two counts of conspiracy to tamper with physical evidence guilty one count of second degree hindering prosecution guilty guilty on all counts across the board and uh, again, um, this was a six panel jury, not the typical 12 uh, that we see. Someone made a comment, which is um, tough to swallow, tough to listen to, but it is true. Um, Michelle Traconis' child will be able to visit Michelle in prison. Jennifer Farber's children will never be able to visit her because there is no body. We don't know where it is. Uh, a judge declared her dead legally back in October. Uh, but where in the world uh, could they visit their mother? Uh, nowhere. And that is um, really, really profound and depressing. Uh, COE, imagine your kids. Uh, you know what? I can imagine it. And I'll tell you why. And this will depress the hell out of everyone. My own grandfather uh, was Gaston Auschwitz, Laszlo Chris Haber. I write about it in the book. And when we went this summer to visit my mother's hometown, he was uh, cremated in a crematorium after he was gassed. So there is nowhere to visit him. Uh, and what they did was they just wrote his name on my great grandfather's tombstone. Um, everyone has probably turned off YouTube now because they are so depressed. It's Friday. You're supposed to be in a good mood. But that is the truth. That's the reality. And I only bring that up right now because there is nowhere to visit. Uh, my mother, you know, she needed a place to see her, her father, and the only place she can go to is her grandfather's uh, tombstone where his name is written, and that will be, sadly, um, the future for the 
Barber children, at least when they want to go visit the mother. Um, if they ever I do have a desire to, to visit Botus, that's a different story. Go ahead, Celie. Sorry, I, I cut in. Um, I do want to just share this quickly, and then we'll go back to this feed since I don't want to watch this person fixing her hair. Um, I did want to just share this here for a moment. This was put on by Justice for Jennifer. It's a Facebook group. It's a group of, I believe, 1,100 women, maybe men and women, but I think it's 1,100 women who have now created, since Jennifer disappeared and was murdered, who, who have created this group to bring awareness and give support to women and men who are experiencing domestic violence, specifically in Connecticut. Many of them were in that neighborhood. Many of them were shocked with what was going on and they continue to keep this up. A lot of them were there throughout the trial, all 27 days, showing up wearing purple to support Jennifer, to support her family, and to also bring awareness for domestic violence. So I did wanna share this with you. Obviously it is not the kind of memorial that that they would the family would have if there was a body but it is some kind of memorial that the community has created for her and some of the people in that group are very young women who say they don't know Jennifer but that they were inspired by the story of the community coming together of people talking about how amazing Jennifer was and obviously of the tragedy and sadness of her leaving behind five kids unwillingly. So um, obviously a, a very tragic story, but I did want to share this because sadly these stories are so heavy, but there's always this beautiful silver lining of some people coming together to support their community and to step up and support other strangers or other people who may be going through similar situations. Mm. Uh, Jennifer Farber was last seen on May 24, 2019. So uh, that is the last time her kids would ever have seen her. Um, and again, Michelle Traconis, uh, the last time her kid will see her as a free woman is going to be May 31st or May 30th um, when she is uh, when she ascends. Yeah, this is heavy stuff. And we're uh, like I said, we're recording the book right now. So um, it is um, it is just reading it is pretty heavy. And, and we've got. Um, how do I say this politically correctly? We're in a actual recording studio in Miami and our engineer is, um, how do I say this? He's like a 25 year old stoner and at the place reeks of weed. And, um, he, he, he can't believe what he's hearing. Um, and it's amazing. He's, he's so invested listening to this story about Carm. So just a little side note there, uh, obviously the jury here, was not allowed to speak about the case um, until deliberations. And they sat in that de deliberations room and came to this conclusion after COE. When did they actually start? When were closing arguments? Tuesday? I, I, I can't keep up anymore. Tuesday. Yep. Tuesday. Tuesday. And then uh, they wrapped at around like three or, or I'm sorry, deliberations started around like 233. So yeah. Closing. And by the way, they, they started deliberating Tuesday afternoon. They deliberated all Wednesday Thursday. Then they started this morning at 10 01 and they did it for about an hour and a half. And there was a verdict. Uh, by the way, Ann Ritchie, she can't say where her bot, what the body is because that's admitting guilt to poor children and their mother and from Scotland. Maybe now that she's convicted, um, maybe now, uh, while she's sitting in there, she will, uh, soften up. Usually people get hard in prison, but maybe she'll soften up a little bit. And, um, Perhaps we will uh, one day find out where this body is. Um, sadly, like I said, there's tons of water around the state of Connecticut. And uh, it would be my guess that uh, that's where Fotis put her. But who knows for sure? Um, COE, I want to bring this up because I don't think um, law enforcement ever gets enough credit. We always talk about the, uh, the attorneys. But um, the lead investigator here, his name is John Kimball with the Connecticut State Police. He tweeted out, um, I think right before closings, um, that he was going to be in the courtroom with other members of the Western District Major Crime Squad and New Canaan police officers. And they were going to be sitting alongside Jennifer Farber's family um, in a sign of support and solidarity, seeking accountability in this terrible crime. And this person, John Kimball, the detective, later tweeted out, please keep Jennifer and her loved ones in your hearts today. Justice for Jennifer, um, 
uh, he said in another uh, tweet, as I just mentioned. So, you know what, STS, shout out to Detective John Kimball and his team, because without you and without law enforcement, this case uh, never would have gone to trial and it never would have gotten a conviction. So uh, the real hard work always starts with law enforcement doing thorough investigations. And that is what happened here. Uh, COE. Do you miss local news? Do you miss scrambling to your spot, getting your mic in hand and no, when I your saw, hair? No, when I saw her fixing her hair, I had news PTSD. That's why I was like, let me let me switch what we're looking at. But I was going back to what you were just talking about with the detectives. I mean, we've even spoken to so many people on our show, um, Joel obviously on air, but I've speak to some of the guests off air, like Phil Waters and Scott Duffy, who are former detectives and FBI agents. And so many of these cases are also so personal to them. I mean, I know that for this specific detective, I mean, he seemed to really take this personal. He was there every day. This was meaningful to him. So it is it is nice just as someone who has been sitting there watching the trial. It's nice to see that there is a personal connection and these detectives really have put their heart and soul into trying to find justice, whatever that may be. Um, Joel Space Ghost. Don't talk smack yeah, about your but, ears. <laughs> uh, but I did want to pull up this comment here. Joel, do you want to read this? Uh, wow. Can't say I'm completely surprised, but didn't think conspiracy would stick. The jury did a great job as well as the state closing arguments by the state were stellar. How come I had to read that? And not you. I am uh, speaking, by the way, with Lisa Daddio via text. She is um former New Haven lieutenant in the police department. Um, and so... Uh, that is the case. Um, I was just going to say that, again, 30 percent of STS Nation thought that there would be a not guilty charge for conspiracy and then guilty for the rest. I think what I found fascinating about watching this case was the process of the jurors having to absorb so much and then and then the stress. I mean, again, I, I know so many of you guys are professional trial watchers. It was really one of my like first few trials that I watched at home from beginning to end. And I do feel for the jurors. I think they did a good job. I think they were very diligent. But it's a trial like this puts a lot of stress on the jurors. And it's a very big burden. And it's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. So whatever the jurors decide, I, I think they did a good job, regardless of whether or not I would have voted the same. By the way, COE, you bring up a great point. Jurors, uh, that is the backbone of uh, the American judicial system. I was talking about law enforcement, but all those jurors uh, need to be thanked and respected. Uh, people sometimes get upset with jurors that they got the decision wrong, but uh, they're obviously doing a public and civil service, uh, and they're getting paid basically nothing for it. And this trial was seven weeks of their lives, which they will never get back. But um, they sat there every day. So kudos uh, to all the jurors in this case. Um, and uh, a lot of people, including myself, think that uh, they got it right. Although a lot of people didn't think that they were going to necessarily convict on that conspiracy to commit murder. Um, Debbie Gibby here, uh, 49 plus 30 years. Uh, she's 79, 80 when she gets out doing the math for us. Um, Suzanne, I feel so very sad for all the children and for all the victims around Michelle Traconis and Fotis and for what. Maybe this will make some others think twice, but who knows? So much grief and sadness. I don't think it ever ends. That's the sad part. Um, I just think we'll see the next couple, um, the next husband, wife, or whatever it is, or custody battle. Uh, people just don't think of uh, the repercussions. Um, so that is um, that that that's what it really comes down to. Faro Gamma, who's on here frequently, uh, Photos Dulos was good at compartmentalizing. There's no telling where the body is located. May 24th, 2019 was the last day. COE, I've got a cough, so I'm going to let you talk for a minute. Okay, I'm typing. Um, and just for those of you guys who are just joining us, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. The breaking news today is that Michelle Traconis was found guilty of all three charges, six counts. Right now, what you're seeing there, we're uh, just looking at a podium. 
the news conference has not started. This is obviously very typical, as you guys know, since you guys are pros at this true crime trial watching stuff. Uh, so as soon as they come out here, we are going to take the audio, but we have muted it for you guys. But we are just watching um, and waiting for this press conference to begin. I know earlier today we did show you video of Michelle Draconis walking into the courthouse. She did walk in with a large group. Her family has been by her side through all of this. We saw her walking in with her mother, with her boyfriend, with her daughter, um, and with a couple of other people. I know a lot of you had commented earlier on the fact that Michelle Draconis and um, I don't know if it's a, a relative or a friend have been recording all of their interactions and walking in and out of the courthouse. So it'll be interesting to see what happens here when they come out. But obviously, it's been um, it's been a very interesting, what is it now, 31, 32 days of this trial. It's been very long. We've all been waiting and waiting for this day where a verdict was reached. Then it just happened about an hour and a half ago, an hour ago. By the way, uh, STS Nation, if anyone knows, uh, I've got two requests for you, by the way, today. If anyone knows, number one... Um, an interesting trial that's um, getting set to start next week, surviving the survivor at Gmail. Uh, the COE will look at that. Ethel, stop barking. Um, COE, you've got to get a soundproof room. This is professional now. What are you doing? Um, number two, if anyone happens to have an email contact, this is going to sound crazy. I'm going to ask this again at five for Joe Rogan's producer, Jamie, whatever his name is. Please let me know. Surviving the survivor at gmail.com. I would uh, I would appreciate it. Um, so John Schoenhorns, go ahead. Joel, sorry, I just want to hop on. Daryl, uh, we're live right now. I don't know if you can hear us. If you want to just be on audio, then please take your uh, please don't show your face. And I, I don't know if you can turn your camera off. If you want to be on camera, you can just hold your phone up and we'll pull you up right now. Um, I can pull you in here. I just don't want to surprise you if we if we catch you and you don't realize that you're on camera, but your camera is turned on. Okay, I'm going to pop you in right now. Joel has no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm going to pop you in right now. And then Watch we'll make what sure. What are you talking about? I know exactly what you're doing. Hey, Daryl, how are you? Good, how are you? And I'm sorry I'm misconflicted about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, for those who do not know, Daryl Cohen is... Uh, criminal defense attorney, trial attorney out of Atlanta, Georgia. He's on court TV all the time. And uh, he is joining us by phone, I think, sort of. Um, uh, yeah. and let, Darryl, just the, let him know what we're seeing, just in case he doesn't want that. Yeah, Daryl, if you we're seeing like your your hand, but if you want to just turn the camera off, it's up to you. Uh, whatever. I'll there try. You know, I'm glad to turn it off. I'm just not sure how, which you is see that unfortunate. Little video. Although we're seeing the top of your face now, which is not bad. Uh, yeah, let me get what? rid of it. All if right. I knew how to get rid of it. Okay. Well, we, that little video we like, camera icon is. You Daryl, can, we, you like, we like seeing you. We like seeing you. Just Daryl, bottom line, are you surprised by this verdict? Almost all the experts we talked to said it would be uh, guilty on most counts, but not the conspiracy to commit murder charge. Did that surprise you? It surprises me a bit, but again, when I'm dealing with juries and I'm dealing with people, especially post-pandemic, people don't think the way they used to think, and they don't act the way they used to act. So I'm not at all surprised about being surprised. Is that double and, talk uh, or what? No, that's no, 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 that's good. Um, this guy John Schoenhorn, the lead defense attorney, uh, there were. There were a lot of people in our community, and obviously he had a very difficult job, and you don't want to uh, point the finger at a defense attorney. But let me just say this. He, he, he objected very frequently, and his demeanor in the courtroom, people did not love, and I'm talking about our own community. Um, our community could be the jurors. Do you think that um, just, I don't know, his style may have had an adverse effect. Is that something that you consider in a jury returning a, a verdict? Well, he's different than I am. I don't believe in a lot of objections because I think once you have a lot of objections, a jury thinks you're trying to hide something. And that's just not who I am, not the way I try cases, but everybody has their own way of trying cases. They have their own style. 
And I think Ann Jeanette's about to join us. Um, COE, uh, Hold you're on, about not to yet, take not yet. I'll let her know. <laughs> she's going to give me a thumbs up when she's ready. Don't worry. Don't no, worry. no, no, no. Uh, I'm saying I've got to go to this uh, book recording. So I'm going to leave you all in amazing hands. Uh, COE, are you panicking right now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you know the name of the defense attorney? His name is John Schoenhorn. He's going to come out. Michelle Manning for the state uh, will be coming out, and uh, they are going to be delivering comments uh, in just a few short minutes. What, uh, what we lost is- we lost Daryl, right? Yeah, but Andrewnette's going to be hopping on here in just a few minutes. Um, okay, so we're we're just on standby with her. Well, uh, what me, time is just- your recording? Uh, in fifteen minutes, and I'm thirty minutes away. Uh, so do the math. Uh, if All you right, do the math on that, it is not favorable to me. But um, Anjanette's getting set up here. Um, just going back to John Schoenhorn for a minute, the criminal defense attorney. By the way, look, look, look at this. COE has a panicked <laughs> look. This isn't this isn't as easy as it looks. No, because I, I wasn't <laughs> planning on on doing this for you, Joel. Uh, but... It's not as easy as it looks, even though she gives me flack sometimes. Um, do it every day. Taylor says, I want to hear from attorney Cohen. How is people's thinking and acting changed since COVID? I think maybe there's less patience, although I don't know for sure. Uh, by the way, you're looking at the uh, outside of the Stamford, Connecticut courthouse, uh, the criminal courthouse in Stamford, Connecticut, uh, where we're waiting for. We'll see if the defense attorney speaks. Usually he does. I'm sure the state will take a victory lap uh, today. Uh, Sunshine Cheryl says, COE, you will be just fine. Um, just a quick reminder, because we went over, um, some of the state's closing arguments, but John Schoenhorn, uh, with the defense, uh, he basically said, um, and this was his argument throughout that whatever Fotis Dulos's role was that his client, meaning Michelle Traconis, uh, never planned to harm her. And, and she had no idea that Fotis was capable of doing something like this, but the COE, you got to ask, um, She's a, you know, presumably uh, an intelligent woman. I mean, she had a job with ESPN. She was uh, had her own media company. Um, Is it possible that she had no idea what was going on when they went through all those rolls of uh, paper towels and he was spending hours upon hours cleaning the house and the car? You really think she had no idea what was happening? Well, and it's interesting you bring that up and maybe Antoinette has some perspective. Love you all. I have to run. Uh, I'm leaving it in two power, powerful Thanks. women's hands. Uh, <laughs> hey, Antoinette, how are you? I have to run. Hey. <laughs> the Marlboro School would be so proud of you, COE. Love oh you all. God. I'll see you at 5 p.m. Eastern time today. Antoinette and the COE are taking the rain. <laughs> Welcome. You're a surprise co-host. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> for a very short time, I should add. <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't don't worry about it. But Joel pretty much was just talking about the fact that um, you know, whether or not well, first of all, let's get your take on let's get your reaction and then we'll get back into what Joel was discussing. Are you well, surprised? I am not surprised, and I'll tell you why. The other night when I was on with you guys, mm-hmm. I said that I I thought that possibly they would be hung on that first count, the conspiracy to commit murder. And then after we got off the air the other night. Um, I think the next morning, yesterday morning, I saw a tweet from somebody talking about really breaking down uh, the Celebrate testimony. And that's the testimony where like they take your cell phone or a cell phone and they basically can download everything the cell phone does. Uh, You know, I pick it up and I literally do this and it records that I've done that. And the person who put this tweet out really outlined some interesting information about how Fotis was gone. And all of these calls were coming in and he's not picking up yet. There's an orientation change. And that means like the phone goes like this or somebody opens it and something happens. And all these calls are not being picked up into photos time frame, except for the one call that comes in from the front. And that is the call that Michelle answered. Interesting about that was the fact that the phone was basically on the move or moving around at times. So I thought that was pretty damn. Then I got a text last night from a friend of mine who's like, what did you think about the questions from the jury today? And I said, you know, I really don't, I, I said, I don't know if in the weeds on other stuff today. And I said, what were questions? And he was telling 
they um, accessorial can't talk accessorial liability does not require physical contact they whether this meant did, did she have have any you know it, we're, we're having a hard time for some reason you're going in and out i think it's your okay. way not mine sorry can you repeat that for me i know you were talking about accessorial <clears throat> liability yeah there was a question yesterday apparently they were asking about whether or not um, they wanted clarification on whether um, she had to have physically done something to hide evidence in order to be guilty of a charge and whether she had to have physical contact in order to have done that. And so that just didn't sound very good um, for her. So I kind of thought, you know, I think I said the other night, I thought there's, there's no way this thing's going past Friday because I, I knew they wouldn't want to come back. So maybe they just needed to answer, have a few more questions answered, and then they wanted to sleep on it. And they came back this morning and took a vote and went around the table. It's only six people. And, you know, they're like, yeah, I feel, I feel okay about this because it is a big decision. So they took their time, obviously, in deliberating. They took several days. Um, so I'm not entirely shocked after that question and then reading a little bit more about what was going on with his phone when he was gone. I'd love to go to Jennifer this morning. Well, and I, the part that I find interesting, too, is at first when there were all of these questions, I know at least in our chat, people were were getting a little nervous. Um, people that were were hoping to see a guilty verdict because they thought that there was enough evidence were getting nervous thinking, you know what, as more time goes by, this could be a good sign for the defense. But I think you're right. It was interesting that they were really focused on the verbiage and focused on going through to make sure that they understand what the charges and the counts are and what is required of them as jurors in terms of finding what is and isn't um, you know, available. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted here. It appears that someone's walking out. No. Okay, sorry. I just saw some cam some cameramen there. But I, I thought it was very interesting that they were focused on the verbiage. And I think you're right. It ended up really being that that they were confused or, or concerned about whether or not they had to have a physical touch. And clearly, they thought that there was enough evidence. And mm -hmm. as, as you go back and you review the evidence that was discussed in the trial, for you, was there anything that that was, you know, not the smoking gun because there wasn't that in this case, but was there a moment where you thought, oh, wow, you know, I, I think there could be guilt here? I, you know, I think that that phone call that I mentioned, uh, this is friend where, you know, other calls weren't answered that morning, but the one from the friend was that, you know, the so-called what I would call an alibi call. And then, you know, when I thought more about it, the friend of hers testimony, the one who said she came to the shop and whatever, and that's, she usually did that. And it just, all of that kind of made me think, I, I know they called her to dispel some of the things the state was saying, the defense did, but I really felt like Michelle may have, you know, potentially, uh, you know, cause I'm not on the jury, uh, may have potentially gone to the store, uh, you know, to give herself an alibi. So I, I just think it's so unlikely that somebody comes home and it's like, you know, Fotis comes home and he's like, oh, I, you know, I killed Jennifer and her, you know, her body may or may not be in my car or in this truck. And there's, you know, blood and garbage bags of stuff and all this stuff. And it's awful. And you're just like, okay, well, we got to take care of that. I mean, it just seems to me like, yeah, you might have a free moment, not maybe, maybe, but I mean, we are talking about the taking of a human life. And so I, I think that the phone call and possibly um, the trip to the store, plus that celebrate information, which I, I didn't see that part of the testimony. I, I saw the summary on Twitter, as I mentioned, and testimony about what was going on on this phone. That was pretty yeah and again you're you're cutting out a little bit um in and oh, out so sorry wi-fi but i just wanted to go back and say yeah that's what joel was mentioning right as he was leaving is again all these little details you know was it reasonable that michelle didn't know when they were out disposing of this evidence was it reasonable that michelle would have had photos phone was it reasonable all these things and so i i do think the state did a really good job of 
making that point, especially in their closing arguments. And question for you, since you obviously have so much experience in covering a lot of these different cases, uh, Rassler's mom here says, I've never seen bail for someone found guilty on all charges. Is is this something that you've seen before? I can't recall that. I feel like on a case like this where we're talking about murder, typically they you are sent back without bail. But I feel like maybe $6 million dollars a six million dollar bail with house arrest and gps monitoring i mean that may be essentially the equivalent of no bail i mean does yeah. she have six million in property or cash to put up and then when she gets out maybe she gets to hang out with her daughter or her teenage daughter and uh you know be on until sentencing and sit in her house all day i mean it's basically like kind of in jail, just a nicer version of it at your own home. So um, I, I don't think I have a case where homicide, maybe in other types of cases, uh, but I, I would be interested to see if she can actually come up with that money because she's already like two point some odd million dollars. So she would come up with like, do that thing is three point whatever million more in property or cash. That's a big change that made the equivalent of no bail. i sorry. I just want to ask STS Nation because I'm having a hard time. I feel like you keep cutting in and out. I just don't know if it's for me or for everyone. Guys, if you're also having a hard time listening, let me know. Um, and again, what you're seeing here right now is a press conference. We are waiting to hear back uh, to see when this press conference will begin. This is the uh, post-trial press conference that we're waiting for. People are obviously exiting right now. And again, as soon as that starts, we will put the audio up for you guys to hear. Um, and Jeanette, overall, what, and I don't know, you know, how extensively you covered this case, but was there anything that surprised you here? I mean, I know you said you, you wouldn't have been surprised whether it was guilty or not guilty for conspiracy, just because we were sort of... Um, anticipating that there could be a not guilty for conspiracy. Yeah. But I, I thought they would be hung, honestly, on the oh, on wow. the conspiracy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the more I thought about it, when, once I saw those things, the, the celebrate stuff, uh, the summary on Twitter, and I heard about that question last night, I was like, ooh, you know, she they may find her guilty. I thought they would find her guilty on everything else, um, but not I thought possibly hung on count one. Um, another thing too, just so your viewers know, um, right now, you know, John Schoenhorn is probably in there talking to Michelle Traconis. Uh, he's, you know, that's typically what goes on. He's probably gone back, talked to her, telling her what their options are, what they're going to do moving forward. Uh, the DA um, prosecutor may be speaking with Jennifer Doulis's family. Um, and maybe getting kind of a statement together, things like that. So that that might be why there's some sort of delay, or wouldn't it be something if they don't come out and say anything at all. Yeah. You know, so. what, I would find it shocking because I've been surprised. Schoenhorn has been very vocal, yeah. or I guess I wouldn't be surprised because he's so he's so vocal during during the court session as well. But he's been very vocal. I've been watching the local news, and they've been catching him and getting sound bites from yeah. him. I feel like almost every single day. So and he got I, his pot cleaned. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Although I, I feel like he definitely would want to put some closure to what he has also worked on for several weeks, if not, you know, several years, um, you know, in anticipation of this trial as well. And come out and say, we're going to fight this on appeal. You know, we just don't think the evidence was there for, you know, count one or what have you. Um, so I'm sure he'll come up with something to say, but I do have to run though. I'm so sorry. I have to go do some Thanks. things for my show. So no, of course. <laughs> Thanks of for course. having me. And I'm sorry if no. I've been cutting up here, breaking up. Um, no worries. We're honored to have you. We're always so grateful when you uh, grace us with your presence. So thank you so much and good luck with your work day. Have a <laughs> great day. Thank you. You too. See you Bye. guys. Bye. All right, everyone. So we are going to continue to just wait here. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I know that it was a little hard to hear her because I think she has some Wi-Fi issues, not on my end, but on her end. So just wanted to give you an update. She says that right now uh, she believes the attorneys are probably speaking to both Michelle Traconis and her family. And then the state is probably also debriefing 
the family, the the Barber family on everything that just happened and, and what this means for all of them. So uh, we are on standby. As you can see there, there is a makeshift podium put up by all of the media outlets. There is local news there. There are uh, print reporters. There's probably national and international news as well. This has obviously been a case that many people have been following. And if you're new to the case, I just want to catch you up quickly. This is a case about Jennifer Farber Dulos. She was a 50 year old mother living in Connecticut, a 50 year old mother of five who dropped her kids off at school on May 24th, 2019, and then disappeared, was murdered, was never seen again. Michelle Traconis was just found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and tampering with evidence. It was three charges, six counts. And Michelle Traconis was connected to Jennifer Farber Dulos because Michelle Traconis at the time was the girlfriend of Jennifer Farber Dulos's estranged husband. Jennifer Farber Dulos's estranged husband is Fotis Dulos, who unalived himself after being arrested and facing charges. So he is no longer with us. Jennifer Farber Dulos's life was taken from her. And now those children, those five kids, have no mother and no father. Michelle Traconis, as of two hours ago, was found guilty of three charges, six counts of conspiracy to murder and tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution. So this is a trial that many people have been following throughout the world and have been following very closely. And right now, if you are just joining us again, we are watching um, the scene there. This is outside of the courthouse in Connecticut. We're just waiting for media and uh, waiting for attorneys to come out and speak to us. We believe that the defense will probably comment as they've been very um, consistent in commenting nearly every single day after court and during lunch breaks. Um, in terms of the state, I don't know whether or not they're going to comment. They've been pretty quiet, which is usually very typical for prosecutors. But now that this is over, they may have something to say. So I uh, just wanted to update you guys there. I, I believe we do have Daryl here on the phone for us. Uh, Daryl, I'm going to pull you up. Okay. Daryl, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you so much for being here. This is uh, the, uh, my name's Eliana. I'm Joel's wife. Um, but I'm filling in today as his host. He had to run off to go do another podcast. But we are live, so everyone can hear you right now. I know that we lost you earlier, so just wanted to get your take. It's Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, Daryl, I'm sorry. We're going to have a press conference start right now with Michelle Traconis' family. So uh, hold that thought. Okay. You got it. Good morning. <laughs> Good afternoon, sorry. Uh, well, today I'm going to talk in name of my family. It's hard to me because English is not my first language. I came many years ago to this country looking for opportunities, freedom, and justice. And I moved my whole family here. I have eight grandchildren, American. <laughs> and today we are here devastated because it has been a tremendous injustice in the trial of my daughter. She's innocent. And we will keep proving that forever. I forgive the juries, the judge, and the prosecutors, and God will prevail the truth. Also, I think that the influence of the media has been having tremendous effects on this case. Thank you. Will there be an appeal? This is definitely a devastating day because my sister is innocent of all the charges that she was convicted of. And we are certain that she is innocent. And I know that only time will prove it to you guys. 
I know that everyone wanted answers. I know that maybe the state is happy that they finally convicted her or someone is paying for the price, but she's not the right one. We still don't know what happened to Jennifer. We're all mothers and we all love, as you can see, Michelle has been supported by us, her family and friends from day one. And we continue standing here because we too care to know the truth of what happened to Jennifer, but we don't know what happened to Jennifer and choosing and putting my sister as the guilty person is not the right thing to do because she's innocent. So we will appeal and we will not stop fighting for her justice that this so country has apparently promised to us because as an American myself, this is an injustice completely. So my sister will eventually come out. She has to because she's innocent of everything that she's been charged for. Thank you. I just want to, you know, like they said, I'm, I'm the mother. I'm devastated. And she's innocent. And I know that. My heart knows that. She doesn't have anything to do. And the misery will continue because to put her in jail doesn't, it's not that, oh, Jennifer appeared. No, we, nobody still knows what happened to her. But she's not the one that knows. She never knew. She's innocent, and that's it. Thank you. My sister is innocent, and this wasn't a fair trial. And you all know that. You all know, look inside your heart. The media from day one, day one, attack us, harass us. Okay, you, probably the moms out here know, my sister doesn't know what happened to Jennifer. We want to know. We pray every night for the five children i met them i know them they were they are beautiful kids so is my niece she was never separated from my mom from my sister my niece it's my sister it's all her world for my niece have some compassion i mean your heart look inside your heart we cannot live in a world this with this much hate my sister's innocent this is wrong. This wasn't a fair trial from day one. Wasn't a fair trial. And you all know that because you are parents, you are moms, you are grandparents. Please look inside your heart. This world needs more love. And this is wrong. What happened to my sister today is wrong. It wasn't a fair trial. It wasn't. My last words go to Petros, Christiane, and all the five children. I don't recall the name right now. I personally have been praying for you every day, mornings and night. I'm sorry about what happened to your mommy, but my sister is not the answer. And I hope that when you grow up, you find your own means to know what happened, to seek for the truth, to seek for real justice. This is devastating. And I said since the first time, this is a tragedy for all the families involved and for all our children too. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I want to say something. Okay. Hey. Hi. Ask yourself why they didn't interview the only person that was with Michelle the day that everything happened. Why they didn't interview the person that was with her the day that she was first arrested? Why the police didn't interview me after I was in the timeline? Why they didn't interview me when I was in the warrant? It's not a coincidence. Can you say your name? She planned to bond out and Dr. Carlos Troconis. All right, so we're uh, going to keep watching here to see who else comes out next to see if the attorneys come and speak to us. But uh, if you're just watching us, that was the family of Michelle Traconis. That was her father, and those were, I believe, her three sisters, and then Clara Petu Duperon, who was the last witness in the defense's 
sorry, in the defense's lineup um, of, of witnesses. So um, listen, it was very emotional. Those are family members who obviously just saw their sister being convicted, being charged, uh, being convicted to three charges and six counts of conspiracy to murder, of tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution. Um, not sure if we are waiting for anything else. Oh, it looks like Schoenhorn is doing some one-on-one -on -one interviews. So we're going to keep this up here and keep watching to see what they say. But um, obviously that was that was a very emotional um, and very passionate and heated interview with family members. I think regardless of whether or not you think anyone is right or wrong, guilty or not guilty, obviously family members do have the right to feel whatever it is that they're feeling as they go through this. I will say um, it was interesting to see Oh, you know what? I think we're going to start here. Hold on. Let's stand by. Well, to answer the question that hasn't been asked, I'm truly disappointed in this verdict. I don't believe that this was the correct verdict. I'm not going to criticize this jury that sat through six, seven weeks of evidence and reached their determination. I just happen to disagree with their determination. The, um, to answer another question that hasn't been asked, um, Michelle is devastated. Um, her daughter has been informed. Her daughter is not here. Um, her whole family is devastated. Um, I heard some of what they said. You know, I, I've been doing this a long time and, you know, it's not like I'm cynical or hard-boiled about this, but I truly just don't see how the jury could have reached this verdict. We intend to first file post-trial motions. One of them is going to be for a judgment of acquittal notwithstanding the verdict, and there will be many, many issues uh, we'll present even before sentencing. We'll also be preparing for sentencing. There's a lot of support. Michelle has a lot of support. And um, people will be submitting letters and we'll be preparing for a May 31st court date. So if people have questions, um, I'll answer a few, although I don't really feel like it. Well, the first step is to file post-trial motions for new trial, where I list any number of reasons why the trial itself was not fair. Some of the issues predate the actual trial, going back to the hearings that took place in the fall, some of the, the rulings that go back a couple of years. So it's going to be a, a post-trial motion that lists all of those things. Normally those are pro forma, meaning you file it just to file it. I believe that many of those issues have merit and only if those are denied and Michelle is sentenced you then file an appeal. And the question is, what do you argue on, argue on appeal? In my view, it's not just whether there are any issues, it's which ones not to argue because of how many errors I think there were in this process. Is she going to bond out next week? It appears that the amount is too high for the bondsman to be able to post without getting additional surety approval. So it appears she will not be getting out today um, we hope that she'll be getting out in the next few days, but it's not going to happen today. She is going to be going to uh, York and Niantic. Uh, I don't want to even speculate. Um, the maximum penalty has been set forth, but, you know, it's somebody with no criminal record. Um, she is not accused of uh, herself of, of harming anybody but it's serious charges that she's been found guilty of. So uh, it could be uh, several years. Let me put it that way. After the playback of the testimony from the friend and then yesterday's question, what was your mindset as you arrived in court today? Well, I thought that the question of when they wanted to hear back from uh, Clara Duperon was favorable. Um, the way though that they asked the question, did, did um, the jury feel that you actually had to physically uh, touch any of the uh, items in order to be guilty of tampering. 
I didn't particularly like that question, but as I, I think I said yesterday, because the definition of accessory was separated from the charges of accessory to commit an offense, I thought it could be neutral. So I don't speculate and go, oh, that's a good question. That's a bad question. You know, you could sit there all night and think, well, why are they asking that question? It could be one person wanted to know. They just didn't know that the statute 53A-8 meant accessory. Um, the only other thing that if I can, you know, I have a, you know, a, a wider audience here is that people in my view should never sit down with the police for interrogation they should never do it because people forget it's not just things that are bad that can be used against you it's anything can be used against you and that's what i feel was done here do you have any insight on the strategy that was in play at that time in june of I, 2019 i have no insight as to why any lawyer without either an immunity agreement or a proffer agreement would walk their client into a police interrogation without knowing very much about the offense. Now, that's me. So you might want to ask the lawyer that did that. At least we know one other lawyer that for Mr. Gumieni got an immunity agreement in order to have his client cooperate. That is the strategy that would have been the more appropriate, in my view, again, uh, reasonable action for uh, for a lawyer to take. But you're going to have to ask that attorney why he did what he did. In my view, the entire case, and even as closing argument set forth, was based on what she said to the to the police during these hours and hours of interrogation. And I guess the jury did not accept the fact that people are not fluent in, in English or who are tired or badgered are told lies and then asked to, uh, now what do you think? Now are you willing to admit that you didn't uh, act truthfully before? Um, you know, you can draw negative adverse inferences from that. Just in my view, it shouldn't be enough to find someone guilty. But again, that's my view. If family is adamant that this was not a It is not for me to decide whether a trial is fair or not. I believe these jurors were fair based on the evidence that was allowed to come in and the way that things were instructed. My issue will be whether or not the rulings that allowed in certain evidence, that allowed in hearsay in my view, were incorrect and therefore this there was a due process violation and errors that would entitle uh, Michelle to a new trial. But, you know, I'm not going to get into questions of fairness and whatnot. That's not really my role. In hindsight, should she have taken the stand? You know, in hindsight, as I argued in my closing argument, hindsight is can be 2020, right? Um, I don't know if it would have mattered. The jury got to hear an unbelievable number of hours of unfettered interrogation. She answered questions till they had no more questions. Some of those questions, in fact, were posed by her lawyer in those uh, recorded interrogations. So whether or not she needed to say anything, what could she say that she had not said during those interrogations? They would have just asked her, well, you said this on this date and this on that date. She answered every one of their questions. My view, she shouldn't have said anything, but that's that's what I look for in hindsight. I did not represent Michelle at that point. But we'll go forward. We're going to uh, um, challenge whether or not the, the trial had errors that should be reconsidered. And if not reconsidered in this court, then we'll go to the appellate or Supreme Court. Thank you. President, have hearings still on for Tuesday? I'm not from Bob. You're going to have to talk to Attorney Frost, who represents um, um, Michelle in that case. That, that's all I know. I'm not going to be here on that. Thanks, John.
All right, if you are just joining us, hi everyone. My name is Ileana. I am the COE, also known as Joel's wife. Joel is recording stuff with Carm for their book. They're doing the audio recording. So I'm stepping in today to host here for this breaking news. I believe we still have Daryl with us on a cell phone. I think it's channel three. You Darryl, do. You can, you hear, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Thank okay. you so much yeah. for being with us. I appreciate you. Um, so I'd like to ask you a few questions about what we just heard. So the defense attorney here was talking about due process violations and how he thought there was an unfair trial and that some issues predate the trial by a few days or maybe even by a few years and that he wanted to appeal for that reason. Talk to us a little bit about what that means and what the likelihood of something like that is in a case like this. Well, first of all, if he had his client acquitted, he would have done a great job. If she was convicted as she was, he didn't do a good job. That's neither of which is true, but that's as the public sees it. Now, when his client, before she was his client, sat down with the police, with law enforcement, and gave lengthy, lengthy, unbelievable lengthy amounts of comments and subjected herself to questions, he is saying, in his view, that was inappropriate and he never would have done that. Now, I tend to agree with him. I only allow my clients to say something if they're help, it's going to be helpful to them. And if we have either a written immunity agreement or a proffer that this will be used only in this limited way. But all of us have a different view. The law is not black and white. Guilty or not guilty is, but there are so many nuances. And the jury obviously did not like her. And that to me is of paramount importance. So whether or not he is going to be successful on appeal, time will tell. We'll have to look at the transcript once the court reporter has transcribed the trial. And this is going to take a long, long time for them to attempt to have this verdict overturned. We just don't know until we see the transcript as we see whether or not these admissions allowed by the court were appropriate and proper. Now, obviously, the court believes that they were appropriate and proper or the judge would not have allowed it. But judges are human beings. They wear a black robe, which gives them some invincibility, but they're not perfect. And they make mistakes like every other human being every day. They just do the best they can. And Daryl, in, in this specific case, we all know, obviously, because we watched it, Michelle Traconis was interrogated by the police. We saw those three different interviews, but there was an attorney there. Does that change the fact that maybe there wasn't a violation here and maybe there were no errors done or could this defense attorney, um, Sean Horn, still fight for that? Well, you do what you have to do and you do it with the available evidence and the available energy that you have. Because there was a lawyer there doesn't mean it was proper. It could be ineffective assistance of counsel, which is what this lawyer is saying that her defense lawyer is basically saying that this lawyer did not do what he should have done. He never should have allowed her to be interrogated, never should have allowed all of these complete numbers, unbelievable numbers of questions and time. Because what he's really saying is, if you ask me a question today and I give you an answer, not a yes or no answer, but some sort of explanation. And if you ask me the same question tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, very easily I could give you a little bit of a different answer or a completely different answer. And that's what he's concerned about. And that's what, in my view, happened in many instances in this case, that she was not 100% consistent. And people aren't. That's the way it works. We're never 100% consistent. And as a result of that, the juries decide what they decide, how they want to decide it, and they make their decisions based upon what they believe is accurate. And remember, 12 men and women on a jury, for the most part, are very naive. They are spoon-fed by the prosecution, spoon-fed by the defense, and they try to reach a verdict which is obviously Latin for truth. So what we don't know is what her demeanor was that bothered them in the courtroom. That to me is probably paramount in this case. 
what I didn't watch it. I paid attention to it, but I didn't see what she was wearing. I didn't see her body language. I did not see her facial expressions. These things make a difference to 12 men and women who are not seasoned jurors. And we seldom, if ever, have a jury with seasoned jurors. We may have one or two, but that's about the extent of it. And what about um, the actual bond here? So the attorney, a lot of us were wondering what was going on with Michelle Traconis, whether she was going to, uh, you know, be able to go home or if she was going to have the money for bond or whatnot. But he is saying that Michelle Traconis is definitely not going home today, that she could be going home in the next couple of days if they're able um, to pay that bond. But is it normal for a bond and house arrest to be offered for this kind of offense? I mean, she was found guilty of the three charges a total of six counts for conspiracy, to commit murder, for uh, tampering with evidence, and for hindering prosecution. Absolutely no. And this will, no is spelled N-O, not K-N-O-W. It is highly unusual for someone who's been convicted on these types of charges to be allowed a bond. So that tells me that the judge is not on board 100% with these convictions. Oh, interesting. It tells me there's room, there's room to maneuver. And it and may very well be, I don't mean to say this, it may very well be based upon what I'm hearing about the bond that the prosecution, the defense may be able to work out a plea bargain of some sort to avoid all of this in the future. Okay. And so what would that mean? Because trial, you know, we just obviously saw a trial. So what would be the next steps if they are trying to find some kind of plea bargain? Well, if they are able to reach an accord, then the court could give grant a new trial. And then shortly thereafter, usually minutes, there would be a plea of guilty of some sort entered to one or more of the charges that she was convicted of. And that's not unheard of. And that's not necessarily unlikely in this case. Again, the bond thing is what just is a neon blinking, flashing light in my eyes. Most of the time, a person is not allowed a bond once he or she has been convicted. And one of our uh, regulars here, in fact, one of our oldest viewers, Maui Swift, is asking, aside from the interrogation, which we already discussed, do you think that there were mistakes as the defense attorney suggested? Because I didn't watch the entire trial verbatim and keeping in mind, I'm a seasoned trial lawyer, but I'm not a perfect trial lawyer. I've never met one. So if he believes that there were errors throughout the trial, then he may very well be right. But he also may very well be seeing it from his point of view and from the defense point of view, as opposed to not the prosecution, but as opposed to a neutral point of view, which is supposed to be the judge on the bench. And was there anything in this case that surprised you? I mean, I, I feel like just and I'm Daryl, I know you don't know me. I'm just a lay person. I'm a former journalist. I'm a mom of three. But I did watch all 27 days of this trial. But for you as an attorney, as you were, you know, reviewing this, even if it wasn't verbatim, but as you were listening and watching this trial, were there any moments that surprised you in this trial? I didn't like the interrogation. I didn't like the amount of time the jury had to listen to, pay attention to the interrogation. That is very unlikely in most cases and unusual. So that bothered me. And I think that bothers her defense lawyer, her current defense lawyer. And he may also, that is her current defense lawyer, may suggest to her to go after her previous lawyer for ineffective assistance of counsel. In other words, not doing the kind of job he should have done based on the circumstances. And I don't know what her previous lawyer's background is. Is this person a longtime criminal defense lawyer? Is this person a former prosecutor? Is they, are they brand new? Do they normally do civil trials? All of these things matter. But it matters to me that he allowed her to be interrogated, not just Q&A, not just questions and answers, but interrogated for the amount of time that should, he should have said, thank you very much, in my view, thank you very much, I'm done, we're done, see you, come back, we'll, we'll come back another day if necessary, if we believe it to be appropriate. If not, if you're going to charge her, charge her, and we'll deal with it. 
because the more she was interrogated, the more evidence that the state was able to acquire in order to, at this point, have her convicted and be able to prove to the jury that they felt it was beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. Not every doubt, but every reasonable doubt. And clearly uh, that interrogation or the three interrogations that we saw uh, played a big role in this case. And we do have another question from a viewer, Julie B. Me. She's asking if Michelle Traconis's passport has been taken since she was found guilty or will it be taken um, in the coming days? There was an old commercial on Men's Warehouse and the, and the spokesperson said, I guarantee it. Well, I'm not there, but I can tell you her passport is done. Uh, that doesn't stop somebody from leaving the country illegally or from re-entering the country. But I can assure you her passport is taken. I would also be surprised if the bond did not include some sort of ankle monitor so they know where she is at all times. And Daryl, this trial had six jurors. They deliberated for an hour on Tuesday, a few hours Wednesday, yesterday and then about an hour hour and a half this morning and they came back do you think for a, a juror excuse me a jury of six jurors that that was long was it short was that appropriate how does the fact that there are only six jurors and not 12 jurors affect a case like this well obviously the fewer people you have to convince the easier it is from the prosecution side i don't find that to be an unbelievably long term of deliberation and thinking about it in addition to deliberating with the jurors. But when you only have six, that's six less people you have to convince. And keeping in mind, it only takes one to say not guilty for that to be a mistrial. So I'm not surprised. The bottom line is I'm not surprised. And Daryl, just looking back on yesterday's uh, deliberations, or I'm sorry, not yesterday's, but the previous day's deliberations, the jurors did ask to rewatch an entire 38 minute testimony of Michelle Traconis's friend, who was the last witness on the defense's side. And they came into the court. They watched the entire 38 minutes. How rare is something like that? Or or is that common now in courtrooms where you're able to rewatch an entire testimony? Well, normally, again, you don't have all of this testimony rewritten and rehashed. I like to believe it's one and done and leave it to the juror, each individual juror to make his or her own remarks in their own mind, make notes. It's unusual to hear a complete 38 minute test of live testimony come out. It's just very, all of this case, so much of this case is so unusual and it's hard to put it in a little piece of paper and say, or in a corner and say, this is the way it should be because judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers always react and respond to what is taking place in the courtroom at that time. You have to be able to change your mind or your strategy instantly, instanter, as we like to say in the courtroom. And what about the fact that Michelle Traconis did not take the stand? Did you think that that was a smart move? Do you think she should have taken that? What are your thoughts on that? Normally, you don't want a defendant to take the stand. But in this instance, because she was convicted, and we don't know, obviously, what the appellate situation is going to be until that's done. I Here's my view. If you have nothing to hide, then hide nothing. But the problem with her taking the stand is she had hours and hours and hours of interrogation that the district attorney's office could question her about. So I think in this instance, not taking the stand was the smart road to go based upon what happened before she was charged. Normally though, I don't let a client take the stand. I, I want them to KYD BMS, keep your darn big mouth shut. <laughs> That's probably smart, Daryl. All right. Well, we appreciate you, everyone. This is Attorney Daryl Cohen. Thank you so much for giving us so much time and so much insight. Uh, have a good day and have a good weekend. We appreciate you being here with us, Daryl. And by the way, you're still a journalist, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate you. Take care. Thank you. Take care.
All right, everyone. So if you are just joining us, I'm just going to give us a quick recap here, and then we are going to wrap because I think we've really discussed it all. Um, and for those of you who missed it, you can go back and you can rewatch. I think Joel may try to cover some of this tonight. I know uh, Cohen, Steve Cohen and, and Joel and I are texting on the back end. So we're going to see if we can do some more um, analysis later on for you guys today. But I do want to update you if you are just joining us with the breaking news today. Michelle Traconis was found guilty of all charges. I'm going to pull this up here for you. She is now guilty of three charges, six counts, conspiracy to commit murder, two counts of tampering with physical evidence, two counts of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence, and then hindering prosecution. If you don't uh, recall, there was a lot of evidence. There were 27 days of trial that we watched with you guys on the STS trial channel. There were nine hours of video. Of that nine hours of video, there were three different interrogations. And that's what Daryl Cohen was just referring to. And that's also what the defense attorney just talked about in his press conference. He was saying that he thinks that created an unfair trial by having all of those interrogations entered and, and having those interrogations available and, and letting them happen to begin with. So that's something that the defense attorney was speaking about. He did come and speak to the media after the guilty verdict. And I took some notes. So I'm just going to go over my notes here with you guys. So bear with me as I'm doing this on the fly. So he did say that he is preparing for the sentencing. That is a court date right now as of May 31st, if things don't change. And he says that he believes, this is the defense attorney. This is Michelle Traconis' attorney. He believes that there was a due process violation. And what he's saying is that he thinks that, the, that there was an unfair trial. And he believes that some of the issues predate the trial, some by a few weeks or some by a few years. And he called them what is called pro forma, meaning usually you can just file to file. But he says that he believes there is enough merit in the errors that he thinks were involved in this case. So if he is denied, he says they are obviously going to try to fight for an appeal. Again, that is coming from the defense attorney of Michelle Traconis. He believes that there were too many errors overall, and uh, he's going to go through and try to file that formally with the court. As far as what's happening now, uh, the defense attorney did explain that Michelle Traconis is not going home today. He believes that... Uh, the bond was set too high for the bondsman to clear anything today. So he says that Michelle will not be getting out today, but hopefully in the next couple of days. Uh, not sure what, what that means or when that will be, but we'll obviously keep you guys updated. I do want to share with you guys that we have been covering this trial from day one. If you are not familiar with this case, we're talking about the case where Jennifer Farber Dulos, a mother of five, disappeared and was murdered. This happened on May 24th, 2019. The person who was just convicted of those three charges and six counts is the person you're seeing there on the screen. This is Michelle Traconis. She was the girlfriend of the estranged husband of Jennifer Farber Dulos. This has been a very unique case from the get-go. Jennifer Farber Dulos's body was never found. Her husband killed himself. Michelle Traconis was now convicted. And it has been a case with a lot of unusual things. In Connecticut, the trials do not always have opening statements. In fact, that's usually the norm to not have an opening statement. And that's what happened in this case. The juror, the jurors, or sorry, the jury was made up of six jurors, not 12. That was the case here. And then again, there were a lot of different little things that were accepted or not accepted in this case. So it was definitely interesting if you did not watch it all, or if you're not familiar with this all at all, it's definitely worth going back and reading about it or watching some of our videos. Um, it's, it's a very sad case. A lot of people are affected in this case. Jennifer Farber Dulos, as we mentioned, was a mother of five. We have an old photo of her with her children. Her children are now teenagers between the ages of 12 and 18. They were there in court several times listening, absorbing, mourning, grieving, everything that they heard, everything that they knew, all of the information that they learned. So my heart is with Jennifer Farber Dulos's family, with her children, with her mother, with everyone that is affected. I know even people here at STS Nation were affected just watching this. 
So I just wanted to take a moment to remember the family that is affected. I know that uh, it's a touchy subject, but I also want to take a minute to remember Michelle Traconis's daughter, who was probably also dealing with a lot of trauma and a lot of anxiety and a lot of feelings. Um, you know, it, regardless of, of what happened to the parents, the kids are really the victims here who really had nothing to do with any of this. So I, I do want to take a moment to think about all of them. I also want to thank all of you guys for being here, for this coverage, for following justice for Jennifer, and for sharing so much information with all of us. Um, it really has taken a village to build STS and to cover these cases. And this is the first time we've covered any trial from day one all the way through. And you guys did a phenomenal job of keeping us updated with information as much as we were keeping you updated. So I do want to thank all of STS Nation for your time, for your energy, your facts, your resources, and for helping us fact check. So a big thank you to all of you and a very big thank you to our mods, Gen X Granny, Frankie Figs, Shaquille Oatmeal, I Am Not T-Pain, and Copper Horse. You guys have been amazing. You have been here through every single day of coverage. You've helped us with information. Space Coast keeps this running. Steve Cohen finds all of our guests who can pop on for us last minute, like Daryl Cohen. Um, so I just want to thank all of you guys for doing this. Joel is going to have a show tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern time. It is Friday, so it will be the Friday show with Phil and Scott Duffy. But obviously, this was very big breaking news. So I'm sure he's going to want to probably do a follow-up and bring you some more coverage later on. Just wanted to keep all of you guys updated. And again, if we see anything else, I might pop it up on YouTube in terms of like little videos that come about. But if you missed any of our coverage earlier, you can rewind on here. We do have the press conference of Michelle Traconis's family speaking. We have her defense attorney speaking. We also have the actual hearing of when the verdict was reached and everything that was said. So feel free to rewind and please hit that like button. All right. I have run out of things to say, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us. And again, we remember Jennifer Barbara Dulos through all of this. Thank you so much, STS. Oh, wait, one more thing. One more thing before you go. Not done yet. I forgot to promote that we do have an STS trials channel. Uh, it should be here in the chat if one of the mods can throw it in for us right now. I just want to remind you guys that we do have another channel. We cover trials. This was the first trial that we did, but we covered it for all 27 days. It's right here. You can either go to youtube.com forward slash at surviving the survivor trials, or you can click on the link in our channel. You can also go to our main STS channel and you'll see there, it says second channel. You just click on that, subscribe. And now we have to figure out what trial we're going to cover next, but you should definitely join us on that channel. We talk about the trials, we watch it together. And then we have times like this where we have breaking news and we get to watch the verdict live. So I did want to promote that and share that with you. For all of you guys that have already subscribed, all 5,200 of you, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And now, Space Coast, let's end the show. Thanks, everyone.